This program was recorded with a live audience. Please forgive the occasional sound fluctuations. A few great pairs in history, people whose energy and wisdom and talents have really delighted us and excited us. People like Rogers and Hammerstein, Gilbert and Sullivan, <laughs> Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, dare I say Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> and this evening we have a wonderful pair with us who, when they come together on the rare occasions that they do, then everything becomes magical. Dr. Wayne Dyer and Dr. Deepak Chopra. Thank you. Okay, I just want to introduce you to my Uncle Wayne. <laughs> what um, I have been doing for the past seven weeks or so since uh, Deepak and I and Rita and my wife Marcy went on a tour to Greece together December, the first uh, 10 days or so of December, and we spoke to uh, approximately 1,500 people in Athens on some of the things that um, we'll be talking about here this evening. And when I got back, right after the holidays, I went away to um, a place called Marco Island, and I've been in a retreat, and what I've been doing is writing, writing every day from... Uh, six o'clock in the morning until midnight most of the time and I'm putting together a series of essays on um, the greatest contributors that uh, the world has known over the past uh, 25 centuries or so beginning with Patanjali and talking about um, it's always intrigued me that there were people like uh, especially being when we were in Greece together uh, holding up objects that uh, were made five centuries before the birth of Christ and taking all of this kind of thing for granted as we were touring the, the Parthenon that people like Aristotle and Plato and people like uh, Shelley and, and Keats and Yeats and people like Einstein and Pascal and uh, uh, Byron and all of the great poets and thinkers and so on there's something about the idea that they were breathing the same air that we're breathing I don't know if you ever consider that. And they, um, they were warmed, their bodies were warmed by the very same sun, and they looked at the same moon, and they watched the same stars. And there's a sense of the energy that they sent to us that we still are connected to, and that all of them had great messages to give us. And as I studied all of these people, what I found to be most intriguing is that all of them were really weird. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. So I feel very much at home. <laughs> when I say that, I mean they were, um, they were people who were uh, not, you know, many of them were executed for their ideas. It seems that our society is one in which we look at our troublemakers and the ones that are alive we give a whole lot of trouble to and the ones that are dead we honor. You know. uh, and these honored troublemakers, you know, I studied, I've probably read 10,000 poems uh, just looking for the ones that I wanted to write an essay about what these people were saying to us in their poetry or in their philosophy. And people like John Keats, whom we've all read when we were in high school and so on, and wrote volumes of poetry, I don't realize that he died at the age of 25. And Shelley only lived to be 29. Some of these people experiences, I wrote about Cicero in Rome, and uh, when they didn't like what he had to say, they not only did they decapitate him, but they put his head on the form of the speakers uh, in the city of Rome, along with his hands. And they, put, and they let them stay there for six months so that people could see this is how we deal with dissenters. And today we consider Cicero to be one of the greatest thinkers and philosophers uh, who laid down the, the foundation for uh, our very democracy. So that these people who had something very profound to offer us 
weren't very well received in their day. Two of the people that were most influential in my life were uh, Emerson and Thoreau, who were neighbors in uh, Concord, Massachusetts. Thoreau spent time in prison because he refused to pay taxes <laughs> to a government that was uh, performing a holocaust back in the 1840s through the Indian Removal Act, where President Jackson signed legislation allowing our soldiers to go in and remove these people who had been here for thousands of years and just assassinate them and kill the children and so on because it was our destiny to do so. And he went to jail protesting this. And Emerson wrote about the necessity of being a nonconformist in his essay on self-reliance. And Thoreau wrote about the necessity of civil disobedience. So that there's something about this spirit. I've often called these people scurvy elephants. For those of you who know my work, I mean, when I was a young boy, I lived in a series of foster homes myself until I was almost 10 and orphanages and um, I came home from school in the third grade and I asked the lady that I was living with, her name was Mrs. Scarf out in Mount Clements, Michigan, what's a scurvy elephant? She said, I've never heard of such a term. And she said, uh, where did you hear it? I said, well, I heard Mrs. Poole, who was my third grade teacher, telling the principal that Wayne Dyer was in her classroom and that he was a scurvy elephant. So she called the principal, and the principal said, oh, that's Wayne. He gets everything mixed up. She didn't say that he was a scurvy elephant in her classroom. She said that he was a disturbing element <laughs> in her classroom. <laughs> so, there's a part of us that has to be scurvy elephants. I use this term. And when I looked at 60 of the greatest thinkers and contributors and philosophers and uh, people who gave us eternal truths. Virtually every single one of them were uh, people who were, they were independent of the good opinion of other people. They were not concerned with fitting in, with being what somebody else thought that they should be. I think probably the most quoted lines in all of English literature is from uh, Hamlet, soliloquy, to be or not to be. And it's the most quoted line because it's probably the most profound question you can ask yourself. But what follows it is even more profound. Whether it is nobler in the minds of men to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and thus by opposing end them. And it really is a fundamental question. And it's a question that I would like to talk about here in the, in the time that I have at the beginning of this program. This whole idea of what it means to be, however you phrase it, whether you talk about marching to your own drummer or being the person you want to be or whatever. And I think that there is a level of consciousness, a level of awareness that has many names. And Deepak has written a lot about it and spoken about it. We've spoken about it together in conversations and, and on programs we've done before. In the East, the, some call it Siddhi consciousness. In the West, some call it Christ consciousness. And transcendent consciousness. My teacher, Maslow, talked about it as self-actualization. You know, that there is a level of living that goes beyond just... Um, what we think of as everyday, ordinary human awareness. Last um, Easter Sunday, I was invited to be on the uh, Today Show up in New York, on the weekend Today Show. And it was at the time when right near here, all of those suicides had taken place, as you recall. The 40 people in the Heaven's Gate, and the, that's just like headlines all around the world. How could 40 people just follow somebody, you know, to their death. And I thought I was going on there to promote a book that I had written, <laughs> which was called Manifest Your Destiny. I might as well get that plug in. <laughs> but really, they didn't want to talk about that. They were asking me about what happened and what my reaction to it was, which was a normal thing. It was a, 
it was a spiritual book that I was uh, there to talk about, and it was Easter Sunday. And so they asked me my opinion. And I said, I would really like to have talked to those people for maybe 30 minutes or so in Heaven's Gate. And if I would have had that opportunity, I would have said, number one, that you don't have to get on a spaceship in order to find God. You just have to look deep within yourself. And I think the second thing that I would have told them is that in order to get to the next level, which he was promoting, you don't have to leave your vehicle, which is also what he was promoting. That it's possible to reach the next level in this vehicle, because this is the time to honor this incarnation, to honor who you are and why you are here. And one of the great things that my... Uh, earliest teacher, Abraham Maslow, taught me was that there are really three things that separate out these highly functioning people that he called self-actualizers from the rest, of, uh, the rest of us in ordinary human awareness. He said the first thing is that these people are independent of the good opinion of other people. And as I studied these great contributors that I've written this uh, book of essays about, I found that every single one of them sort of marched to their own drummer, the music that they heard. Independence from the good opinion of others. The second thing he said is that these were people that were detached from outcome. That is, they didn't do what they did in their life in order to receive something for it. They weren't on outcome. They were in what we call process. They were just doing what they do because their heart told them, this is what your heroic mission is. This is what you're here for. And the third thing he said that separated these people out from ordinary human awareness is that these were people who had no investment in power or control over others. This wasn't what their life was about. That their life was much more about being on purpose and letting other people's opinions and how they dealt with things be something that others handled. And if you look at the people in the Heaven's Gate and the, the people who uh, belong to cults and so on, the, uh, they violated all three of those principles. Certainly they were not independent of the good opinion of others, that's what they lived for, was this charismatic leader's opinion. And certainly they were attached to outcome. They were headed towards a better one. And this leader, he, as he called himself, was someone who had great power and control over others. This is what, what his life was about. So that whenever I meet anybody who has an investment in power or control over me, or is more concerned with their outcome, or is more concerned with their good opinions, I know that I'm not with what I think of as an authentic person at this highest level. And these are qualities to really look at in your life. I remember when the, I had this explained to me, when Maslow said, uh, when I asked him, what do you mean by self-actualization? He said, these are people who are independent of the good opinion of others. I said, well, that's what I'm going to do from now on. <laughs> I was 27 years old. I'm going to be independent of the good opinion of others. And he gave me this strange look. <laughs> and I immediately worried about what that look meant. <laughs> <laughs> and whether it would affect my grade, you know. <laughs> so getting to that place where you're independent of the good opinion of others. <laughs> Back in the, uh, in the 70s, in the late 70s and the early 80s, I was a regular on The Tonight Show. I did that show 30 some times and uh, it was... Uh, about every three or four weeks I would go up there and, and do the show. And then I would go home and I had written this book uh, called Your Erroneous Sound. And it was all about not worrying about other people's approval and all of these kinds of things. And I would go home and I would go on the show and when you go on a show like that, uh, you have seven or eight minutes and you have to say something quick and something light and something funny if you want to get invited back. I would go on and I would tell a little joke or say something amusing or whatever and then I'd get home and I'd have five or six hundred letters from people from all over the country angry at me 
about um, what I had said and how I had said it and so on. So I used to think to myself, why do I let these things bother me? Because they did, and I would find myself, all of the nice letters, I would just set aside and say, that's nice, but the people that were saying something, I would want to defend myself to these people. And then I came across this wonderful letter that, um, that H.L. Mencken, who was a humorist at the early part of this century, um, had uh, copied. And, and, every, and he, he would write, he was like a, a modern-day Voltaire. You know, I mean, he just took on everybody. Or Art Buckwald would be another example of a, this kind of a reporter in the, in the 20s. But he satirized everything. And he had written out in one of his columns to anybody who might send something critical to me, <laughs> this is my response. <laughs> and he had done it in advance. And I thought it was so good that I had 5,000 copies of it. <laughs> mimeographed. This was before Xerox. <laughs> 5,000 copies of this thing mimeographed. And every time I would get back from doing The Tonight Show and I got a, a whole host of these letters, I would just seal 40 or 50 of those into, into an envelope and then just send them off all over the country. And I wanted to be a fly on the wall when they would open them up and read them, you see. Now, I'm far too spiritual today to do such a thing. <laughs> But the fact that I like to tell this says how about <laughs> I think a lot about me. And here's what the letter said. I am sitting here in the smallest room in my house. Now you all know what room that is. <laughs> With your letter of criticism before me. Soon it will be behind me. H. L. Mencken. <laughs> I wouldn't do that today. But it's a great anecdote for talking about how to get yourself to this place in your life where you literally become independent of the good opinion of other people without having to, uh, to make them appear foolish. And what I want to speak about here is something that I call, uh, I've called in, in some of my writing and, and tapes and so on, manifesting. This idea of uh, city consciousness uh, or Christ consciousness is a, is a place in our lives where um, the definition of it that I like best is a definition that says that city consciousness is a consciousness in which there is an absence of a time delay between what it is you are thinking about and having it materialize on the physical plane. So in the New Testament, this is referred to as the gift of fish and loaf. Okay, so that when you want to feed somebody and you don't have any food around and you can't get to a grocery store, if you're living at this level of consciousness, you put your attention on food and you are somehow, your energy connects with that food and it appears, called materializing or manifesting or whatever. Now, I'm not saying that here in this program, when it's over, you'll be able to put your attention on having a new BMW in your driveway when you get home, and it'll be there. Although I'm not saying it won't happen. My wife knows how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so does yours. <laughs> I just follow her around saying, how do you do that? <laughs> okay. So I'm not saying it's not possible. But what I'm suggesting here in sort of a humorous way, is that there is the possibility of reducing the amount of time between what it is you put your attention on and having that materialized or show up in your physical world. And what I'm also suggesting is that there is within each and every one of us a capacity 
to be able to put our attention, our energy, our thoughts, whatever you want to call this invisible world, on what it is that we would like to create or manifest and have it show up in our lives. And in order to get to this place, we have to first of all banish the doubt that it's possible and shift from a belief system to a knowing. Now a belief system is one in which everything that you walked into here this evening with is um, that you believe in, that is just a belief, generally is something that has been handed to you by someone outside of yourself. So the tribe, whatever tribes that you showed up in, have taught you and testified and given their experience and told you this is what is possible, this is what is real, this is what reality is, this is your agreement with reality. And we buy into these uh, belief systems and we literally live by these things. But anything that anybody hands us from outside of ourselves comes tainted with doubt, even if it's just a smidgen of doubt, because it comes from the testimony or experience of others. So if somebody tells you something and says, look, this is, this is swimming, and this is what it looks like, and that's water, and you can get into that water, and let me tell you all about it and give you the laws of buoyancy and balance and, uh, and, and all of these kinds of things, and you say, yeah, that's great. And I believe that I can swim. But you don't know how to swim until you make conscious contact with swimming. And so shifting from a belief system to a knowing system is what I'm speaking about here. And most of the things that we believe we can do have been handed to us. The things that we know we can do, like ride a bicycle, dance, make love, dance the Macarena, um, make a lemon meringue pie, whatever, are because we've had conscious contact with it. But in the metaphysical realm, beyond the physical, where it's swimming and dancing and so on, we mostly just know about it. We haven't made conscious contact with it. And I'm suggesting that most of us have forfeited our ability to sort of oscillate or go back and forth between the world that we notice, the world that we see, this physical world of the material, and the source of it. The source of it. And the source of the physical world is not in the physical world. I think the summary, the best summary of quantum mechanics is from St. Paul. He said, that which is seen hath not come from that which doth appear. Another way of saying that is that particles themselves are not responsible for their own creation. That it takes something more than particles and the physical world to be able to create. And we don't know how to make conscious contact very often with that because we have come through a series of beliefs to believe that God or creator or creation is something that is outside of us. We are not connected to it. We are separate from it. <coughs> this is what the difference between ego, which is this physicalness that we're in, and the highest part of us, which is the part of us that is the observer, the witness, the noticer. So there's over here the world that we notice, and over here the noticer. In The Course in Miracles, one of the things that I do before I speak to an audience is I always go over that affirmation from the Course. It says, if you knew who walked beside you at all times on this path that you have chosen, you could never experience fear again. And when you know that, now knowing is conscious contact. Knowing is an absence of doubt. Knowing is what I am suggesting you have to go to, independence from the good opinion of others, and knowing. And you might ask yourself, what in the world does being independent of the good opinion of others have to do with manifesting? And that will become abundantly clear in a few moments. And also, this whole idea of being able to know. Because if you try to manifest and attract into your life what you want by staying over here in the world of the ego, particles themselves, which is what this world is about, cannot cannot make themselves into more particles. They need spirit. And we have to figure out a way to make conscious contact with spirit. So, what I suggest is that there is a method, there is a way, 
to, to get past the belief system and into a knowing. The knowing that I'm speaking about, you know, it is said when Jesus would uh, uh, approach a leper, he didn't approach the leper and say, you know, we haven't been really having a lot of success with leprosy lately. <laughs> In fact, given your conditions, you've got a five-year life expectancy with a 30% chance of survival. There was none of this. You can see all of the doubt that is involved in this kind of an approach to healing. What Jesus would say is, you are healed, and healing would take place. Same with St. Francis. And, and I talked to a great kahuna in Hawaii uh, two summers ago, who was at a talk that I was giving, and I asked him, how do you get to be a kahuna? <laughs> would you take kahuna 101? I mean, <laughs> And he said, kahunas are, are raised on knowing, not on doubt. And he said, when in healing, in the healing world, he said, when a knowing confronts a belief in a disease process, the knowing will always triumph. And we bring knowing to a disease process. Now, it takes an abandonment of tribal consciousness and all of the belief systems that you've had to let you get to a place where you are willing to say, I know that I can heal myself. I know that I can attract into my life what I would like. So what I'd like to do in the remaining time that I have is I'd like to present to you a, um, a means for putting manifesting into your life based upon knowing and based upon being independent of the good opinion of other people and bring it all together. And it goes like this. This has been my observation. What you really, 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 that's four reallys, <laughs> want, you will get. Now the four reallys stand for this. The first really stands for wish. I wish I could get a promotion. I wish I could get rid of this cold. I wish I could make more money. I wish I could have a better relationship. I wish. We start with a wish. So that's the first really. But all, you need all four to manifest. So just wishing is not good enough. You have to go to the second really, and the second really is called desire. For me. And desire is different from a wish in that with a desire you are willing to ask. Ask and you shall receive. And those aren't just empty words from a spiritual text. They literally work for me. If I am in a place where I'm writing and I don't seem to know what direction to go or I don't have the right information or whatever, I ask. And invariably, after I ask, the telephone rings. It happened, what, last week or ten, two weeks ago or so. I was sitting in, uh, in Marco Island. The only person that on the planet who had my phone number was my wife and my other wife, Deepak. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking about, I'm not sure how to say this. I'm not quite sure. You know, and I'd, I'd really like to have a good... And the phone rings, and it's Deepak. And I said, I was just thinking about you and asking if I could get information. He said, well, I got your message in the field. <laughs> I'll let him explain the field, all right? <laughs> and he gave me this wonderful quote from the Ojibwe, if you recall, and, and I wrote in this essay that I was writing exactly what had happened and how it transpired. And I have found that when I stop wishing, I mean, I don't stop wish, but I add to my wishing, asking out loud, please cooperate with me in helping me to create what it is that I would like to have in my life. Asking out loud, asking God, or whatever God means to you. And, and then stepping back and just watching. And just notice it. It's called managing coincidences and synchronicity and some of the things that Deepak will be speaking about. 
The third really stands for will or intention. You shift from I wish I had it to would you please help me to have it to now adding to that I will create this in my life. I will have this show up for me in my life. I intend to get it. There's no doubt there. And the fourth really stands for passion or what I call hardening of the will. And when you harden the will, what you do is you eliminate anybody else outside of you sullying your picture or telling you that you can't get it. When I tell people about learning to manifest, I always tell them, whatever you do, don't tell anybody what it is you want to manifest. Don't tell your best friend, don't tell your relatives, don't tell your soulmate. Keep it to yourself. I say, why would you keep it to yourself? Because when you tell somebody else what it is you want to manifest, you immediately move over here into the world of the ego. And you have to defend it, and you have to explain it. And manifesting does not take place from the world of particle. It takes place from the world of the observer, of spirit. So you want to keep the ego out of it as much as you possibly can. And the way to do that is to have it to be a relationship between you and God, whatever God means to you. So you've got wish, desire, intention, and passion. And if you look carefully at people in your life and in your life experience who have been good at manifesting what they want into their life, you will find that they follow these specifics almost to a T. And they never allow anybody else's opinion or negative assessment to influence them in any way. They have a passion about what it is they want to create. Today there are no new cases of polio in the world today or just an isolated view because of the passionate will and determination of one person who was told you can't get funding, you can't do it this way, this is not possible, this isn't the way we do things, this is the way the scientific community works. And Jonas Salk didn't care about that. I mean, he had that single mind. And when I was reading about people like Michelangelo and Da Vinci, I mean, all of the people who told him that the Sistine Chapel couldn't be painted, you can't do such a thing. Imagine laying on your back for four years, not ever thinking about it not being possible to do. Now, that's the good news. <laughs> If you can learn to put your attention on you, what you want, to ask for it, and to intend that it will attract into your life, and be passionate about it, independent of whether anybody else likes it or doesn't like it, you literally will create it. Because you think what you think about is what expands. You act upon your thoughts, as it says in the Old Testament. As you think, so shall you be. It is out of that invisible world that you attract things into your life. So that's the good news. Here's the bad news. What you really, 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 for really, don't want, you will also get. <laughs> And this is truly the problem for people who are not good at manifesting into their life. Now, I'm speaking about this not as a materializer, but as someone who in 57 years has been able to literally attract whatever I've put my attention on in my life. And it's not because I'm more intelligent, I'm more blessed, I'm luckier, I'm richer, I'm anything like that. It's because I have followed these principles in my life. I have always been a scurvy elephant. <laughs> and I've never listened to anyone out there telling me, I mean, I listen and I'm polite about it, but I left the tribe. I left the tribe a long time ago. They don't know I've left. 
They don't. They still send me invitations to all tribal functions. <laughs> and I rarely attend. And they explain that away by saying, oh, that's Wayne. <laughs> that's just the way he is. You know how he is. You can't tell him anything. That's fine. My mother, who was 81, asked me last week when I was going to get a job. <laughs> now, here's what I mean by what you really, 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 really don't want. And this is the crucial part of it, and then I'll sit down and let Deepak talk. If you understand that what you think about is what expands. As you think, so shall you be. This is like every field of spiritual teaching and discipline talks about the power of thoughts to create into the material world. And if your thoughts are on what you don't want, and that's where you've put your inner energy on what you don't want, then what you don't want has to materialize into the physical world. So if you think that you can lose weight by putting your attention on despising being fat, you have to understand that despising being fat is what you will continue to manifest into your life. And if you put your attention on not having enough money, being poor, and disliking being poor, and expect to manifest prosperity into your life, from an inner energy system which says, I despise being poor, you have to understand that despising being poor is what you will continue to manifest into your life. And if you put your attention on what is in your life, just what is, what is, is what will continue to manifest into your life. And if you put your attention on what always has been, which is what the tribe will tell you to do, we've always done it this way. If your attention is on what always has been or on the circumstances of your life, then the circumstances of your life and what always has been is what you will continue to manifest into your life. So what we have to do, this is like a multiple choice question. It's A, B, C. You can put your attention on what you want. You can put your attention on what you don't want, that's B. Or you can put your attention on what they want for you, that's C. You got those three choices. And if you don't understand that A is the right answer, this isn't going to help you. <laughs> you have to think of your thoughts and your inner world and your capacity to be able to attract things into your life, you have to think of these things as like currency. The currency that you have for bringing into your life what you want is the way that you think. And if you use the currency that you have for bringing into your life what you would like to spend it on what you don't like, don't be surprised if what you don't like keeps showing up. And the people who are not good at manifesting, who will tell you, this is just a lot of nonsense. You can't do this. You can't just think something and then have it work out for you. And they keep wondering why it not working out for you keeps showing up for them in their life. And they will constantly tell you about all the reasons why it can't work, and you never stop to say, but this is how you think all the time. Here's a good way of thinking about it. In the material world, the currency that we have for attracting what we want in our life is called money. Whereas in the metaphysical world, the currency that we have for attracting what we want is called thoughts. So let's go into the material world just for a moment. In the material world, I give you a million dollars. And I say, here's a bushel full of money. Go to the mall and buy anything you want. This is the currency you have for attracting what you want into your life. And you say, I love this game. <laughs> this is great. So you take this million dollars, and you go to the mall, and the first thing you come to is a store that sells plastic trees. 
and you look at this plastic tree, let's say this one over here, you know, that's not plastic. <laughs> and you say, you know, that's the ugliest tree I've ever seen in my life. That thing is hideous. I would never want that tree in my house. It is so ugly. And then you look, and there's a price tag on it, and it says $20,000 for that plastic tree. And you said, that is ridiculous. Here's 20000 send it home. <laughs> then you go to the next store, and in the next store they're selling, I don't know, some kind of crazy lamps. And you look at the lamp and you say, ugh, they want $10,000 for that hideous thing? I would never want that in my life. Here's 10000 send it home. And every single store that you went to in the mall where you had the currency to attract what you do want, but every time you saw something you didn't want, you spent that currency on what you didn't want. You get home and you wonder, how come my house is full of ugly plastic trees and lamps? <laughs> That's exactly what we do when we use our mind to put our attention on what we don't want. I was in Chicago not too long ago. I was doing a book tour, it was in March. And I got picked up by this woman who was sniffling and slivering and stuff coming out of her nose and it was like, it was disgusting, all right? <laughs> and she's to drive me around for two days, all right? So I looked at my watch and it was the 25th of March and that happens to be my oldest son's birthday. And I said, oh, it's an anniversary. She said, what anniversary? I said, oh, nothing. She said. Well, what is it? What is it? I said, oh, it's, uh, it's 20 years since uh, I've had a cold. 20 years ago, I had my last cold. <laughs> and here was her reaction. Oh, just what I need. Two days with Mr. Positive. <laughs> He's going to tell me that all you have to do is think good thoughts and you don't have to get cold. And sure enough, I have to spend my two days with you. <laughs> and I said what I'm trained to say in moments like that. What do you think? <laughs> she said, I think colds are viruses. And they're in the air. And they land on us. And every once in a while, we're going to get a cold. And we don't need people like you to write books and come around and tell us to feel guilty every time we get a cold. I said, and what has been your experience over the last 20 years? She said, well, I get a cold every once in a while. I said, well, we are in total harmony in this car. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, you believe that you should get a cold every once in a while, and you do. I believe you should never get a cold, and I don't. <laughs> Where is the problem? <laughs> she said, well, well, what do you believe? I don't understand it. What do you believe? I said, well, I think colds probably are viruses, too. I don't know that much about it, but I think they're probably viruses. And they land on us, and we have an immune system. And we're not virus like that lands on my immune system, I talk to it. And I say, look, you've landed on the wrong immune system. You are not going to make it here. You're not going to thrive here, I'm telling you. But there's a lady in Chicago. <laughs> who's waiting for you. And so I send these people to you, these little viruses to you, about every three years or so. You see, you go around and you look at people who are good at manifesting and attracting into their life, and you try to get them to put their attention on what they don't want, you'll never get them to do it. They will never say it can't be done. No, I don't want to think like that. They know that if they think something can't be done. Now, if you're not doing what you love, and loving what you do in your life, you can't reach city consciousness. Because unconditional love is one of the elements of this highest state of awareness. Now, for those of you who aren't 
able to do what you love, ask yourself why I am not able to do what I love or live the life I love. And what you will find is you will come up with reasons why you can't do it. And you will put your attention on those reasons. I got a mortgage. I've got all these responsibilities. I'm already stuck over here. I've been here for a long time. I can't make this change. I can't do these kinds of things. And instantly your attention shifts off of living the life that you love onto all the reasons why you can't. And all the reasons why you can't keep showing up. So I would suggest to you that what you do is you shift out of that tribal consciousness. See your life as like a boat heading up the river at 40 knots. And you're standing on the stern and you're looking down into the water and you see there in this metaphor the wake. And ask yourself these three questions. First of all, number one, what is the wake? The wake is a trail that is left behind. That's all it is. Just a trail that is left behind. Second question to ask, what's driving the boat? What's making my life go in this direction? Answer. The present moment energy being generated by the engine and nothing more is what's making this boat go. That is how I am processing these moments, these experiences now and nothing more is what's making my life go in this way. And the third and most important question to ask yourself, is it possible for the wake to drive the boat? Can a trail that is left behind, make a boat go? Answer, it's an illusion. Everything that's back there is just a trail. And it's all the tribal stuff and all the beliefs and all the things that you've been told that are back there. And if you use it to keep you from being able to manifest and attract into your life what you want, you're just living the illusion. Get out of the wake. And as you get out of the wake, Understand that within you, you have the power to always put your attention on what you want. It's a new way of thinking. Catch yourself in every moment that you have your attention on what you don't want. You're going through a struggle, a, a tough divorce. I am only going to put my attention on being happy. And every time I have an inclination to put my thoughts somewhere else, I'm going to bring my thoughts to what it is that I want. With passion. And I will attract it into my life. And you can do that with healing. You can do that with making the job promotion that you want, creating the kind of relationship that you want, and manifesting anything into it. Thank you very much. God bless you. Now that you've heard all about the belief system, let's get into the knowing, huh? I think um, Wayne's basically laid out a very good map for how do we get beyond the belief system into the knowing. And that happens through the evolution of our own consciousness. What Wayne has been describing has actually a very beautiful laid out map in the great tradition of Vedanta. Wayne mentioned Jonas Salk, who was a great scientist in this area, great thinker, great philosopher. And one of the reasons actually I came to San Diego was because Jonas Salk was here. And uh, in my first few weeks I met him, shortly before he died. And Dr. Salk was already talking about metabiological evolution. Meta, as you know, means going beyond. And metabiological evolution means going beyond biology, the evolution of consciousness. He had just begun to talk about it. He was saying the old paradigm was about survival of the fittest. That was biological evolution. And he said, the new criterion for fitness is going to be wisdom. He said, we're going to be talking about the survival of the wisest in the future. He did not get to articulate the roadmap that he was going to because he died before that could happen. 
And yet, if you look at the various perennial philosophies of humanity, what Aldous Huxley called the perennial philosophy of Emerson and Thoreau and all the great people that Wayne mentioned, and particularly if you look at Vedanta, which is the culmination of all Vedic thought, you see that there's a very, very clear map laid out for the evolution of consciousness. What Jonas Salk was trying to do was to define that map in biological terms, and that's why I was so attracted to him. Because what he was saying is that the ability to manifest and evolve into these other states of consciousness is a function of how our biology operates. For historical reasons, our biology operates mostly in what is called the fight-flight response. And the reason is that uh, a long time ago in our evolutionary history, we were living in a very fierce environment. We were surrounded by predators. And in order to survive, we had to either run or we had to fight. And that's why we are here. That's why we happen to be around. When I was in medical school, the way we remembered the functions of the limbic system, which controls these very basic and important survival responses are the four F's, feeding, fighting, fleeing, and of course, procreation. <laughs> and as a result of that, <laughs> because of that, we are here. All you have to do is watch the news this last few days, and you know what I'm talking about. It's the dominant activity is the forex. All our movies are about it, and all our magazines are about it, and all the books we read are about it. So as a result of this, what has also happened is that we have become the predator on planet Earth. If you could look at our planet from somewhere, some good vantage point in space, and ask yourself, who's the most dangerous animal on this planet? I think, undoubtedly, the answer would be Homo sapiens, the human being. We are the only species that kills its own kind, and mostly in the name of God, from before the Crusades to now, in Sarajevo and Sri Lanka and everywhere else, in India as well, the land of spirituality. We are the only species that kills other species and has successfully caused the extinction of other species. We are the only species that desecrates and pollutes our own mother, Earth. We are the only species that is now contaminating even space. And yet, we are a paradoxical species. We are the only species who actually writes poetry and creates music and architecture, and all kinds of art and science. We're the only species that wonders about the meaning of existence. We're the only animal that asks, uh, where did I come from? What's my life all about? Is there a god? And if she exists, does she care about me? What happens to me after I die? So in a sense, we are a very paradoxical, species. And we are at that place in our evolution where we are being asked to make a choice, at a crossroads, if you will. Are we going to go the way of the predator, or are we going to join hands with the creator and ensure the magnificence and the splendor and the beauty and the sanctity and the sacredness of that which we are a part? And I think the answer seems to be obvious. The choice is very clear. Either risk our own extinction or become creators. So as uh, I've been listening to Wayne, who's been a great inspiration to me, um, he was already writing bestsellers before I was in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to great pioneers like Dr. Jonas Salk 
uh, reading Vedanta, it became clear to me that indeed there is not only a map but a nervous system that allows us to experience that map, not just study it, but actually know it, as Wayne was saying. So I've developed a kind of vocabulary to think about it for my own self. The most primitive response that we have is the fight-flight response. The second most primitive response, which also dominates our society, is what you and I might call the reactive response, where we have a stimulus and without any interval, without any pause, there's an immediate response to that stimulus. And the reactive response is, is in a sense, the fight-flight response in a different form. It's the control drama that we engage in, that the ego engages in. Either we exercise that control drama with intimidation or confrontation or argument, or through indifference and stubbornness, or sometimes through manipulation that involves being extremely nice. Carlos Castaneda, in one of his books, says there are only three kinds of behaviors in this control drama, only three kinds of people, the nice, the nasty, and the indifferent. And in order to go beyond the reactive response, you have to actually, as Wayne was saying a few minutes ago, go beyond the stimulus and the response into the little space that's there between the stimulus and the response, where the witness resides. And in Vedic terms, that witness is referred to as Sakshi. It's the non-judgmental, independent of the good opinion of others and of all opinions, witness that knows not how to judge or label or define or describe or evaluate or analyze, but just witness. And in the mere witnessing of it, to go beyond the reactive response. And that's much of what we practice through all the spiritual disciplines, including meditation, as to how to get in touch with that witness. To become the independent, non-evaluative, non-analytical, non-judgmental witness of whatever is happening. This response, which in a sense began to be elicited by the new human nervous system about 6,000 years ago, and it's very interesting that as soon as the human nervous system developed this ability about 6,000 years ago, with the dawn of the age of agriculture, because man or woman or human beings were no longer having to always guard themselves against predators, and there was a little bit of time to go into this restful awareness. Around this time, we had the emergence around the globe of what are called the axial sages. Moses and Buddha and Lao Tzu and Confucius and uh, Socrates and Parmenides and all the great seers arose around the same time throughout the world. They're known as the axial sages and much later than Christ and all the great prophets that we look back to came around the same time, as soon as St. Paul, around the same time as we started to elicit the restful awareness response. Beyond the restful awareness response, the human nervous system developed yet another ability, which is best called the intuitive response. The intuitive response is to go into a mode of awareness where not only can you have that ability to witness, but you have the ability to do what Wayne was saying, ask. You ask in that restful awareness, in that gap, in that transcendent reality, you ask the question whatever that question is, or you ask for the gift that you want. And in the mere asking of it, there's a connection 
with the cosmic mind because you've transcended space-time into a timeless reality in the restful awareness response. You've sent a message to the unified field, and I'll explain what that unified field is in a moment. And that message is now being computed by cosmic intelligence, and the answer is coming from there. So intuition is a mode of intelligence that goes beyond the rational mind. Intuition is a mode of intelligence that is contextual and relational and holistic. It doesn't have a win-lose orientation. It is uh, never based on direct cause and effect. It assumes that for any one thing to happen in our lives, there is a conspiracy of the whole universe. So if this woman gets a cold, it's because she's inviting a pathogen that every one of us is exposed to, but she's already laid the grounds for a different kind of conspiracy. No illness, by the way, is ever due to a pathogen. That's a very, very misleading kind of idea in medicine, that pneumococcal pneumonia occurs because of pneumococcus, or that AIDS occurs because of HIV infection, or that cancer occurs from uh, carcinogen because lots of us are exposed all the time to all these things, whether they are viruses or carcinogens. Illness is always a conspiracy of improbabilities. It's um, a susceptible host that falls prey to a pathogen. And what we can do is to not be a susceptible host is go beyond these responses, these fear-engendered responses. Intuition really is, is the kind of intelligence that taps into the cosmic mind. So that's the fourth kind of response that we have the ability to elicit. First one was fight flight, the second one was reactive, the third one was uh, restful awareness, the fourth is intuitive. The fifth response, which even goes beyond the intuitive response, is the creative response. As a result of that insight, in the result of the knowingness that you have, as a result of asking the question and placing the intention, is now the ability to create something that never existed before. The creative response, which is a purely human attribute, because we are made in the image of the Creator, it's a purely human attribute to create something that actually never existed until the moment you create it, whatever that is, whether it's a poem or a piece of music or a scientific discovery, whatever. Beyond the creative response is yet another response, which is the visionary response, which is to have a vision of possibilities that never existed before as a result of your creation. The visionary response is uh, I have a dream, and I know how to manifest that dream. And it begins with a very little, small incident. Mahatma Gandhi is in, um, in a train in South Africa, and he's thrown out of it because he has too much melanin in his skin as compared to the English over there. And he suddenly has the vision and the dream that ultimately leads to the demise of the British Empire or Rosa Parks is sitting in the back of a bus and she's asked to move in Mississippi, Alabama, and she suddenly has the vision and the civil rights movement is, is born. The visionary response, which goes even beyond the creative response. And then way beyond that is something called the sacred response, which is really what manifestation is all about, is to Ask yourself, where's all this creation coming from? What's the source of it? Wayne was mentioning poets, and this is something that Wayne and I have in common, that we really, really admire the great poets of our civilization, because poetry, in many ways, is a raid on the inarticulate. It goes to the source of creation itself. And a great Indian poet, Rabindranath Tagore, one day he was looking at a field of flowers. And he wrote this poem where he says, where is the fountain? Where is the fountain 
that throws out these flowers in such a ceaseless outbreak of ecstasy. Where is this coming from? What's the source of creation? And we all have our own kind of interpretations of it. But the source of creation is beyond interpretation. The source of creation is that ultimate ground of creation where we all come from. And in traditional religions, that ground of creation has been referred to, of course, as the cosmic being or God or the source of everything that we consider sacred. And depending on what time we are living in, the interpretation of how we define that cosmic being in a sense begins to change. It's not really important how we interpret that as long as we realize that there is a cosmic intelligence, that there is a cosmic being, and we who think are expressions of, contained in, and a product of that cosmic being. So it's not like we are outside, we are inside the whole scheme of things. The human mind, which tries to understand the mind of the Creator, is itself a product of, contained within, and an expression of that mind. So the more you can understand your own mind, you start to eavesdrop on the nature of that mind. There's a prayer that St. Saint, uh, Saint Augustine had. He said, all my life I've been knocking at the door. And Rumi said that also in slightly different words. He said, all my life I've been knocking at the door. And when it finally opened, I realized I was knocking from inside. <laughs> I was on the inside of it. And Rumi has also said, out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there's a field. I'll meet you there. He said, we come spinning out of nothingness, scattering stars like dust. Look at these worlds, spinning out of nothingness. This is within your power. So what's this field? If you go to a good scientist these days, they'll say, well, there's a lot of work being written about the unified field. Perhaps you've heard that expression, unified field. If you go to a scientist, a quantum field physicist today, and you ask them, what's the unified field? They'll tell you, it's made up of four forces in nature. There are only four forces in nature. The first one is electromagnetism, which is what gives rise to heat, electricity, light, etc. The second one is gravity, which makes the world go around and holds the planets and stars in their place. And the third one is called the strong force, which is the force that holds the nucleus of an atom together. That when you disrupt that, you get a nuclear explosion. So it's the strong force. And then there's a fourth force called the weak interaction, which is basically the force that holds the arrangement of the subatomic particles, which aren't things, which are actually mathematical ghosts, fluctuations of energy and information. Subatomic particles are more like ideas than actual things. And that's all there is. Gravity, electromagnetism, strong and weak forces, period, according to everything that we know in the world of science. And what the unified field theorists are now saying to us is that all these forces come from one fundamental force. They're all the same force. So electromagnetism, which is what? What's electromagnetism? It's light. Ordinary light, which has a visible part and an invisible part. The invisible part is X-rays and cosmic rays and microwaves and radio waves and television waves and all the stuff that we don't see, but we know how it works because we use it to send fax messages to each other and speak to each other on cellular phones and surf the information highway on the Internet. So that's the invisible part of light. And then there's the visible part of light. And ultimately, that's all there is. There's only light. Electromagnetic forces give rise to space-time events, give rise to gravity, give rise to subatomic forces. So when God said, let there be light, he wasn't speaking metaphorically. He was speaking literally. That's what came out of the cosmic mind, light. And you and I are beings of light. And when we go to that place in our awareness where we go beyond the appearance of maya, of physical matter, 
then we do experience ourselves as beings of light, because that's what we are. And this is not just light with elementary particles and forces. This is the light of intelligence, because there's a difference between information and intelligence. Information is, everybody knows what information is right now. It's, it's data. But when information starts to feed back on its own self and evolve to higher levels of its own expression so that it becomes intelligent and creative, then it's no longer information. It's no longer dead information. It's intelligence. It's consciousness. So light is full of consciousness. And the unified field is a conscious energy field. It's literally the expression of the mind of God. And in that unified field, in that conscious energy field, one of the things that's built into it is intent. So if you read the book of Genesis, all you see is God said, let there be this, there was this. God said, let there be that, there was that. Because intent was introduced into that conscious energy field, which connects everything with everything else. And more and more scientists are now recognizing that intent is a force in nature. It's not something that happens to us here, right, in our own minds. Intent is a force in nature. There was a scientist around the time of Darwin. His name was Lamarck, and he coined a term called teleology. And ever since then, now scientists are aware that the best way to explain biological mechanisms is to understand the intent behind the, behind the spirit that was in that biological organism. So Lamarck said a camel has a hump because the intent was to navigate the desert for seven days without water. And birds have wings because the intent was, I will fly. And that this is happening all the time. A giraffe has a long neck because the intent was, I'm going to reach up to that tree. And there are millions of examples of intent in nature, homing pigeons, and you and I have talked about monarch butterflies, and all the miracle of nature can be explained because there is intent built into that conscious energy field. One of my good friends, Michael Flynn, who lives in this area uh, and is an attorney and really a great uh, brother, spiritual brother, Whenever I go to his house, um, I open the door. He has a little parakeet. And as soon as I open the door, this parrot starts singing Beach Boy songs. <laughs> and I was just beginning to wonder, uh, how does a parakeet sing Beach Boy songs? <laughs> and he has a complete California accent and everything. <laughs> and the size of a brain of a, of a parrot is about one-third of the size of my fingernail. It has uh, rudimentary vocal cords. You couldn't call them vocal cords. It has a beak for a mouth. <laughs> and it sings Beach Boy songs. <laughs> Homing pigeons do the same thing. They trace the, the territory. They can come from anywhere in the world to where they were bred. Or you look at the migration of monarch butterflies. In the last two years, Rupert Sheldrake, who's a great English biologist, has written about various kinds of experiments that clearly, undoubtedly, demonstrate unequivocally that intent is part of the conscious energy field. So if you introduce intent, you immediately change the field. But there's a, there's a trick, and the trick is the intent can't come from the level of the ego. The intent has to come from beyond the ego. Now, I was remember um, many years ago in India, I was, um, this long time ago, as a medical student, we had uh, one day a young yogi come to our physiology lab to show the power of intent. And uh, yogis have these extraordinary abilities, the siddhis that you're talking about, some of the yogis. And by the way, yogi, yoga, yoke all come from the same root, which means the unification of body, mind, soul, and spirit and environment. 
So this young fellow, he was about 28 to 29, a very accomplished yogi from the Himalayas. He came, stood in front of our physiology class, and he took a knife and he plunged the knife right through his biceps like that. And, you know, if you did that to my biceps, it would probably bleed. Um, it just went right through his biceps and he stood there. Because to a yogi, a real yogi, this is not a body of flesh and bones, it's a body of consciousness. It's a body of light, and light doesn't bleed. And he put this knife right through his uh, biceps, and everybody was aghast and completely shocked at what he had done. And then there was somebody in the front row, a physician of course, a professor of medicine, who introduced the doubt that you talk about. When it says banish the doubt, and he, he thought this was some kind of a trick. And he mocked the yogi. He said, so what other tricks do you have up your sleeve? And immediately the yogi's attention shifted from his self to his self-image. Because when you, when you mock somebody, who do you mock? Their ego. The spirit is beyond that. So as soon as his attention shifted from his, ego, from his spirit to his ego, this thing opened up like a fountain of blood. And it sprayed everybody in the front row. And then he was such an expert, he was such an expert that as soon as he recognized what had happened, he immediately let the ego go. And he shifted back into samadhi. And as soon as he did that, this thing stopped as quickly as it had opened, like a faucet. So that's the power of intent, but that intention has to not come from the ego. It has to come from the level of the spirit. It has to come from a place where you have totally and completely, unequivocally relinquished your need for approval. Because the spirit does not need approval. The ego only needs approval. So that was a very important point that Wayne was articulating about being independent of the opinion of others. You know, a couple of years ago, or recently, when I was in Australia, I was giving a lecture at the Australian uh, Royal Society, and suddenly somebody in the front row interrupted me, and he said, this is a fraud, and this is this, and this is that. And I said, who are you, sir? He says, I'm the president of the Australian Society of Skeptics. <laughs> I said, I don't believe you. <laughs> the spirit is beyond the ego, has to go there. And when once we start glimpsing that, just once we start glimpsing that, we start to go beyond our ordinary states of consciousness. And what the great Vedantic tradition was saying was that these states of consciousness actually create a certain way that the nervous system functions. And in each state that the nervous system functions, it creates its own physiology and creates its own reality. So you begin to escape from so-called ordinary reality the so-called ordinary reality, which of course Wayne has been referring to as the tribal mind. It's the motley group of sages and psychotics and geniuses <laughs> who can escape that tribal mind. And that's happened throughout the ages. You have to escape that tribal mind. And once you escape that tribal mind, then you begin to see that there are states of consciousness which are beyond the ordinary waking and dreaming and sleeping.
the first stage of consciousness is deep sleep, where our nervous system is in a certain stage and, you know, we respond to stimuli, but in a very primitive way. But it's still a state of awareness. Deep sleep is a state of awareness because you can respond to a stimulus. The second state of consciousness is dreams, where you wake up from that deep sleep into a dream-like state. And you start having some experience in the dream. There's some repertoire of experience. And then when you wake up from the dream state into the third state, it's called the waking state, which is presumably, I hope, what we're in at the moment, at least. Okay? Now we, we look back on the dream and we think, oh, that was just a dream. It wasn't anything real. It was all in my, in my head. And the Vedantist comes along and he says, so is this, all in your head. Okay, you think that there's an external world out there. It isn't. It's the projection of your own awareness. This so-called very physical world is the projection of your awareness in waking state of consciousness. And if you could wake up from this, then it would be as ephemeral, as transient, as temporal as the dream was when you were dreaming. But you woke up from the dream, and then you said, aha, that was a dream. You can wake up from this into the fourth state, which I'll talk to you about in a moment. And then you look back at this and say, aha, waking state, how interesting. <laughs> now, people have experienced that now and then in the so-called near-death experience. And, you know, I mentioned this patient of mine that I had many years ago. That one day he was repairing an antenna on the roof of a neighbor, and he touched a wire that he thought was dead, but it had 12,000 volts of electricity in it. So he got electrocuted. The current went through his body, went through his heart, caused ventricular fibrillation, and he died. That's the mechanism of death in electrocution. He fell from the roof 15 feet below to the ground. That's it. But as his luck would have it, he fell at the precise angle, the precise location, the precise amount of impact to defibrillate him. So when I met him, I asked him, what happened? Bob, he said, God called me. Then he quickly changed his mind. <laughs> and I asked him, what was it like? And he said, it was like waking up from a dream. My whole life flashed across the screen of my consciousness in a few microseconds. And then I went through this tunnel. And you've probably read all this stuff anyway. Now there's so much literature. And then I was in the light. And then beyond the light, a new dimension of existence. Now, since this is many years ago, since then there's been a spate of literature about this experience. But all of the literature says the same thing, all of it. It doesn't matter whether it's coming from Hindu tradition or Christian tradition or Islamic tradition or Sufi tradition. It all says the same thing. A review of the life process as if it was a dream. The whole karma of a whole life kind of flashes across, then a little travel then the light, then a new dimension of existence. It is literally the experience of waking up. Gautama Buddha, who is the founder of Buddhism, on his deathbed, people got around him and they said, who are you? Are you the Messiah? He said, no. Are you a prophet? He said, no. He says, uh, are you enlightened? He said, not really. The Buddha said this. He says, then who are you? He said, I'm waking up. I've just woken up from this dream that you call life. He said, so this lifetime of ours is as transient as autumn clouds. To watch the birth and death of beings is like looking at the movements of a dance. A lifetime is like a flash of lightning across the sky, rushing by like a torrent down a steep mountain. But I'm now awake. Walt Whitman, in one of his uh, poems, having the experience of soul or spirit, he says, I must not be awake for everything looks to me as it never did before, or else I'm awake for the first time, and all that was before was just a dream. So many people have had that without electrocution. It's the whole point. <laughs> it's the whole point of transcendence, to go beyond samadhi. That's what samadhi is. This is the fourth state of consciousness. 
this is the state where we are now going beyond the ego into that silent gap and we're connecting with the cosmic mind. So what happens is synchronicity starts to happen. Why does synchronicity start to happen? Because we've introduced the intent in the field, in the conscious energy field. And it's part of the field. It reorients the field. Ask and you shall receive. The fourth state of consciousness. The fifth state of consciousness, which is beyond samadhi, is called cosmic consciousness. Cosmic consciousness, where the brain functions in a completely different way, where you have the simultaneity of being in this world and not of it. In the Gospel of John, he says, I'm in this world and not of it. And the favorite quote of Wayne's that I have loved to quote from the Gospel of John, he says, uh, Christ says, the works that I do, they shall do also, and greater works than these shall they do. Is that the right quote? Even the least among you, greater works than these shall you do. That happens when you are simultaneously operating in both worlds, in the material world and in the spiritual world. That's called cosmic consciousness. It is to have the witness alive and awake in sleeping, dreaming, and wakefulness. So you have the sakshi or the witness fully awake in dream state, in sleep state, and in waking state, which means your body and your mind are in deep sleep, but the witness is watching that. Your body and your mind are in the dream state, but the witness is watching that. Your body and the mind are giving a lecture or playing tennis, and the witness is watching that. So you never lose sight of the witness, no matter what. The witness is always there. This is called cosmic consciousness, the simultaneity of local and non-local awareness. Fifth state. And beyond that is the sixth state, which is called God consciousness, or divine consciousness, where the witness begins to wake up even in the object of your perception. So you look at this plant or this flower, and as you look at this flower, even on a perceptual level, you see there are rainbows here, and there's sunshine, and there's earth, and water, and wind, and space, and the whole history of creation right here in this flower. And then you go beyond that, and you see there's a spirit there. There's a witness there. And the witness is the same as the witness here. So Vedanta says, if you can't find God in this law, you're not going to find God in some book of religion. God is this life-centered, present moment awareness that allows you, even perceptually, to go beyond the appearance into the reality. This is divine consciousness. You cannot escape God, no matter where you go. In fact, because this... Witness is everywhere, all at the same time, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, and it's right in this moment as the present moment witnessing awareness that we're in at this moment. How can you avoid it? Vedanta says spirit is not difficult to find. It's impossible to avoid. All you have to do is have your attention in the right place. Don't let your attention get distracted by the ego. Just give that up. And the Course in Miracles, of course, says, give up all attack thoughts. As soon as you give up, because, you know, if you realize that the self here and the self everywhere is the same, every attack thought, no matter who it's directed against, is that yourself. So as soon as you give that up, you're right in that field of present moment awareness. And here the synchronicity accelerates to the point where you experience the miraculous. The difference between the invisible and the visible is shortened. So this is what manifestation is about. The difference between the time interval between the unmanifest and the manifest gets very shortened. So instead of calling it synchronicity or coincidence, you say it's a miracle. Beyond divine consciousness, is the final stage of consciousness, which is called unity consciousness, where the spirit within merges with the spirit outside. St. Augustine again, he says, Behold, you were within me, and I outside myself, and there I searched for you. But then I found you within me, and then I found you outside me as well. You were everywhere. And when that individual 
spirit merges with the cosmic spirit, that state of unity consciousness is beyond our individual personality. It's beyond our skin-encapsulated ego. And in this state of consciousness, Vedanta tells us that we experience our individual body and our cosmic body as being one. Normally, we don't experience that. Normally, we say, this is me, and then this is everybody else. Or this is me, and that's the world. But in unity consciousness, you say, this is me, and that's me, and that's me. The expression, Vedantic expression, I am that, you are that, all this is that, that's all there is. And if you really, really, really get that, then, of course, there's nothing more to say. Good night, thanks for coming. (laughs) In unity consciousness, the universe is experienced as our own body. It's also this experience of immortality. Rumi has a great poem about that. He says, let the waters settle, and you will see stars and moon mirrored in your own being. This is the state where we go beyond the miraculous. So there's a roadmap, and that's the nice thing. The roadmap has been explored by Walt Whitman, by Emerson, by Thoreau, by all the great sages of the East, by all the great prophets. And now we are beginning to understand that not only is the roadmap has been explored, but the human nervous system changes its physiology to create those effects. You can actually study brain waves in cosmic consciousness very different from ordinary waking state of consciousness. So I just wanted to add those words to what a great foundation you laid, Dwayne. Thank you very much again. What we're going to do now is take uh, a few minutes, maybe sort of dialogue, and if you have some questions or anything that you would like to ask us, uh, speak up loud. We would like to dialogue about some of these. I just jotted down a few of the things where we really sort of overlapped. One of the people that we both admire greatly was a 12th century Sufi poet named Rumi, who wrote 12 poems a day every day for 12 years and had a teacher whose name was Shams 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 who most of his poetry did not survive Deepak is putting out a uh, a beautiful CD that I heard in Greece of poetry of Rumi that he and several well-known people are reciting the poetry it's just absolutely stunning and magnificent his teacher Sham was said to have said, I, me, you, he, she, they, these are distinctions which do not exist in the garden of the mystics. And I like to think of my life and being in a situation such as this or a seminar here at the Chopra Center for Wellbeing or wherever as a garden of mystics. The Native Americans put it a little differently. They said, no tree has branches so foolish as to fight among themselves. <laughs> and when you think of a consciousness that you were speaking about, about this unity consciousness, there's, there's a sense in which you almost have to, you have to be able to see yourself in everyone else. Isn't that uh, kind of what you're saying? I mean, it's like, if you, if you can't see you there, then your ego immediately becomes involved. And it's almost like you have to step back and watch yourself. One of the things that my wife and I did to really dramatically improve quality of our relationship, because sometimes we would say to each other, this, uh, this doesn't sound like love when we would find ourselves talking to each other in ways that neither one of us wanted to do. And we said, well, rather than, rather than trying to be right with each other, let's just stop and say, how can we be kind? In other words, how can we make the kind response? And I think the kind response is the unity consciousness response. And I think it's true not just in how we relate to each other as uh, husbands and wives or with our children, 
but with waiters and waitresses and, and flight attendants and baggage handlers and, and people on the freeways and so on. It's something that we haven't really uh, grasped for ourselves. And it's a way to let this higher part of ourselves, which is where manifesting, I mean, if there was one thing that I said and that Deepak reiterated back and forth is that, that manifestation does not take place from the ego. Particles are not responsible for their own creation. You've got to get over here. And getting over here is, is taking that stance where you see yourself in that person which you are about to attack by making them wrong. And instead saying, I don't have to have an ego here. Thank you for telling me what a jerk I am. <laughs> I needed to hear that. Or whatever. And letting go of that sort of attachment, if you will, to, uh, to the, that's like one of the ways to get to spirit. And when you get to spirit, manifesting becomes something that you create the intent with. Once you are over, once you are out of that physical world and into the witness world. And it's something that, uh, as a people, we're not really good at. It's almost like, it seems to me, as a people, we have to have an enemy. Doesn't it? I mean, it's like if we have an enemy, we've got someone that we can all, we can all be uh, opposed to. But now that we don't have any enemies, we sort of go after each other, <laughs> you know, because we're still into that. Uh, we have to create this, that kind of a relationship in which somebody has to be right and somebody has to be wrong. If you can let go of that in your own life, manifesting becomes a real possibility. I think it's true in healing as well. Yeah. See, the American Indian poem that um, Dwayne was talking about, it's a great thing to remember whenever you get caught up in the ego. Because the ego is full of self-importance, and uh, you, Castaneda also has said that self-importance is a mask for self-pity. That one way you can know whether a person is feeling sorry for themselves is that they act very important, because that's what they're trying to cover up. And so self-importance, self-pity, ego are all the same thing. And this is a Ojibwe poem. It says, now and then I go about pitying myself, and all the while my soul is being blown by great winds across the sky. And every time I sort of get caught up in that, you know, I just recite the poem to myself. I say, mm. you know, here I am going about pitying myself, and all the while my soul is being blown by great winds across the sky. You were mentioning baggage handlers. I, a few weeks ago, I was getting my baggage checked in um, in Chicago, <laughs> Chicago, and there was this uh, young... Did she have a cold? Was it somebody with a <laughs> Actually, it was a young man. He was probably 18 or 19. He was Afro-American, and he had unbelievable sparkle in his eyes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was loading my bags, and he suddenly, his eyes locked into mine, and he said, Deep stuff, man. <laughs> I said, what? He said, deep stuff, man. <laughs> so I said, oh, so you understood it. He said, no, <laughs> but it sure sounded true. <laughs> You know, and that's the difference between knowing and rationalizing. Yes. You don't have to know this. Every, you know, a child knows this. This is the kind of thing that doesn't need experience because it's timeless. I had a, a great experience this summer. I don't know if I, I talked about it in Greece, but uh, I don't know if you were in the audience at that time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> This past summer, we were on uh, Maui with our entire family, and we have uh, a little girl uh, who was seven at the time. She's now eight. Her name is Sage, our youngest daughter. And she has had um, a thing called flat warts uh, on her face since she was about uh, three and a half or four years old. And every time we would take her to any uh, medical doctor, they would always tell us the same thing. These are flat warts. They can't, um, they can't be treated. There's no known uh, cure for it. We don't want to burn them off because they could scar her face. They will go away, and so on. And she's heard this, but three and a half years later, not only has she still got them, but they're progressively getting worse. And this past summer, uh, 
I noticed when she was out in the sun that they were not only around her mouth and around her nose, but they were moving up around her eyes now. So her whole one side of her face was covered with these, uh, with these flat warts. And she never liked the word flat warts. <laughs> she didn't think that that was a nice thing to call them, so she called them her bumps. You know? The person that called them flat warts was her sister, Serena. You know, Ugh, you know you've got flat warts. You know? And she hated to hear that word. So we were over on uh, Maui, and there's, a, there's a, uh, a doctor over there. His name's Kenny Mallet, and he's a person who has decided to uh, practice where he loves to be. He's a surfer, and, uh, and he's also a dermatologist. So he decided, I'll open up a practice on Kihei. And, and, and he comes to a lot of uh, talks, and he reads uh, the uh, books and the kind of things that Deepak and I do, and so on. And he's always sending me things, and, uh, and I send him things, and so on. And really young, bright, spiritual guy. Um, very unusual in the medical community. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for him to be attending my lectures. <laughs> we were over there, we were getting some sunscreen and doing all these things, and I said to him, would you mind taking a look at Sage's uh, face here? And he said, he looked at it, and he put this big white light on her face, and he said, oh, Sage, he said... Uh, you've got flat warts. And right away she went, oh, great. That's just what I need. And he said, but the good news is that when you get married, uh, you won't have them. And she's seven. So, I mean, she was really concerned about her wedding day, you see. Uh, he said, they will go away, and there's really no known cure. And all the things that we have been told about these flat warts, you know, that it's a virus, it's in the skin, it'll go away. And so finally he said to her, he said, you know, but he said, the thing that I, he said, I can't give you any medicine for them. But he said, I have found that inside of you, there is the ability to get rid of these things. That the virus is in you and also the cure is in you. So that if you start talking to these things, and talk to them in a way in which you say, I really accept that you've been with me for three and a half years, but now I would like you to please leave. And <laughs> you put your energy and your inner healing capacity that you have, you can get rid of these things. And Sage was like, oh, her eyes got real wide, and she was listening, because she's had these for a long time, and it's, uh, it's troublesome to her, even though she never really acknowledged it outside. And we went back to the uh, place on the other side of the island where we're staying, and when we're on Maui, the kids kind of get, go to bed when they want, and they get up when they want, and they have uh, their friends over, and the rooms are filled with, with people, and they go to, they eat what, pretty much when they want. It's just for freedom time, all right? And um, I went into the room about... 2.30 in the morning, and all of the kids, all of the children, there's maybe eight or nine kids with their friends, and they're laying on, the, on the, all the different uh, air mattresses and so on, and they're all jabbering and talking away. And uh, I, over in the corner, there's Sage, and she's under uh, a blanket on her, uh, on her air mattress. And I reach under the air mattress, and she's got this blanket, and I said, Sage, what are you doing under there, honey? It's almost 3 o'clock. And she said, shh. I said, what? She said, I'm talking to my bumps. <laughs> and I left, and I walked into the bedroom in the other room, and I said to my wife, I said, hey, guess what? You're not going to believe the Sage is in there talking to her bumps. Isn't that great? So that we didn't think any more of it, and the next morning I looked at her, and they were still there. And that night, the next night, and the same thing happened again the next night. I went in there, and she was talking to her bumps. This was now Wednesday. Well, what I want to tell you, she'd had these for almost four years. On Friday... Of that week, four days after she had heard that and been talking to her bumps, not one single bump or flat wart was left on her face, and not one has appeared since then. Wow. Now, see, but Sage doesn't have an ego. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's the whole point. It's an, and I said to her, I said, honey, what did you do with those bumps? She said, they're not bumps, they're flat warts. And I <laughs> She said, I gave them to Serena. <laughs> but inside of us is that knowing, is that little child who doesn't say, oh, you know, I can't really heal myself of these things. I don't have the capacity to do that. She has something inside of her. I don't know what you call it in the medical community. What it is, is a, an intention. You were talking about intent and a knowing and an absence of uh, any thought that I can't do this. She was so 
determined and convinced that she was going to do this, that the energy to heal herself of something she'd had for almost four years was there. And to this day, her face is as clear and smooth as, as, as a child could be. So it's a very, very important point here, and I want to address this yeah. just from a medical point of view. You know, I, was, I trained as an internist and neuroendocrinologist at Harvard and BU and Tufts University in Boston, and I remember, oh, 20 years ago, a patient walking into my office who'd just been to an oncologist with breast cancer, and she was devastated by the news. Uh, because it was stage four, and you know, to talk about statistics and so on. And I, as soon as she walked in, I said, "Mrs. Smith, I have good news for you, and I have bad news for you. The bad news is you have stage four cancer, which has no cure. And the good news is I'm a quack. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe I can help you." I think everyone here has heard, and you should tell them about Marcy. Oh yes, yeah, so I will. Yeah, mm. one. The, the, the thing to remember here is everyone's heard about the placebo response, right? You've heard about the placebo response where if you sort of have the intention that this drug is going to help me, it creates a physiological response. In fact, in the last 10, 15 years, we know how that happens. If you think that this is a pain-relieving drug that you're taking, then as soon as you take it with that belief, your, your body generates endorphins and enkephalins that are more powerful than any heroin you can buy on the street to actually create that analgesic in your body. So the intent gets transformed into a molecule. Placebos work in ulcers and other things, etc. So every time that intent is introduced beyond the ego, it creates a biochemical response. That's what a placebo is. It comes from the Latin word, I shall please. That's the origin of the word. What doctors don't know about is the nocebo response. The nocebo is the opposite of the placebo. You say, Mrs. Smith, you've got stage 4 cancer, and uh, the statistics show that in about 6 months, 90% of people will die from it. Now, as soon as she hears that, then she, of course, thinks she's in the 90% who are going to die. She doesn't think about the 10% who are not. And first of all, you know, which something that we don't recognize, even as smart physicians don't recognize this, that statistics actually have nothing to do with prognosis in the patient. It's like saying the average temperature in San Diego for the year is 75 degrees doesn't tell me what today's temperature is. Mm. Okay, if I say the average income in La Jolla is $100,000, it doesn't tell me what your income is. Statistics never apply, <laughs> never apply to the individual patient. So you cannot prognosticate on statistics. But we do it all the time. We create the nocebo effect, and then we create that whole thing, you know. Statistics, and this at the risk of being a sexist joke in medical school, at least one fellow uh, told me this uh, joke. He said, statistics is like a girl in a bikini. What she reveals is obvious. What she conceals is much more interesting. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you heard the other one? Nine out of ten statistics are wrong. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Including this one. Including this one. So remember, Nasibo, in, in Australia, they have a custom in the Aborigines... If you don't like somebody, you go to your Australian uh, uh, Aborigine um, uh, no, sorcerer, his shaman, and witch doctor, actually, and you say to this witch doctor, you know, I want to get rid of this person. So he takes this little stick. He does a ritual around it, mantras and or Aborigine sounds and so on, and he tells you, okay, now you point that stick to your enemy. Within 24 hours of pointing the stick, the person starts to get nausea and vomiting. Three days they are dehydrated. In one week they're dead. The Australian government actually outlawed mm. the custom of pointing the stick amongst Aborigines as murder with a lethal weapon. So that's how powerful an idea is. It gets transformed into what 
you know, is being prognosticated. So statistics should be totally ignored. That's message number one. And the message number two is don't put your attention on what you don't want. Exactly. If you're trying to get rid of this cancer, don't think of I don't want to die. Think of how I want to live my life. And, and be cautious about all of the places where you're going to run into the kind of information that will help you to put your attention on what you don't want. Because almost, and that's called the energy field. So the, what, whatever field of energy that you are in, if you allow it to be contaminated by other people who are bringing you down, you will find yourself you know, buying into the very thing that you don't want to create for yourself. So it's like keeping your energy field really clear. That's why you don't share it. You know, the doctor tells you, you know, you've got uh, six months to live. You, you don't tell anybody about that because people are starting to count the days. You know, and where there's a will, there's a relative. You know, I mean, they're going <laughs> to... <laughs> How Deepak and I uh, became uh, friends and colleagues was, uh, oh, it must be 10 years or more back now that uh, my wife was, uh, was I, mean, I was in Seattle and uh, I got a call from her. I was doing a, a, a book tour in, in Seattle and I got a call from her saying that she had a nodule on her thyroid and that, uh, oh, I mean, it was the worst kind of prognostication and I thought, you know, that one of the doctors that she had been to said that she would have to have surgery immediately, she very likely had cancer, she was going to lose her throat, I mean, it was just, and I was devastated, I was going on Good Morning Seattle or something and uh, trying to catch my breath and thinking my wife, who was in her 30s, is, uh, you know, and Deepak's work uh, was just coming out at that time through Nightingale Conant and so on, and I think we were scheduled to appear together on a program in San Francisco, as a, as a matter of fact. I called his office, and, uh, and Marcy went to uh, the center. It was that, at that time, it was in, uh, in Lancaster, Massachusetts. And Deepak became her physician. She went through the whole Panchakarma treatment through and learned to meditate. And she had never meditated before. And when she learned this meditation process and when she went through all of the, the various uh, massages and all the lectures and the, the whole intense thing that they offer at the Chopra Center, um, well, today, her, you know, she's not, she was told that she would have to be on thyroxin, uh, you know, an, an artificial thyroid supplement for the rest of her life. She doesn't take anything like that at all. Her thyroid is normal. And she's, um, you know, healed, been healed of that. And my friend, Dr. Chopra here, is, is someone that my wife believes saved her life. Yeah. It's a true story. Yeah. Well, you talked the, before, and I did also, about this idea of the source. What is the source? You know, you, I remember being a little boy living out at this, uh, at this foster home in, in Mount Clemens, and we had this practice in the, in the spring where Mrs. Scarf would take a big uh, bag full of dried tomato seeds. I was little, I was four, my brother Dave was five, he was with me, and I was the, uh, the digger. I had this little uh, hand shovel, and I would dig a hole, and Mrs. Scarf would take the dried tomato seeds and put them in the ground, and then I would cover it over, and Dave would uh, take the sprinkler can and he'd pour water on it, we'd put a stake in there, and then we'd move three feet away, and then we'd do it again. And we did it through this whole plot of land. And I could remember asking, as if this were yesterday, I said to Mrs. Scarf, I said, where do these tomatoes come from? And she said, oh, God brings us the tomatoes. So I said, well, if God brings us the tomatoes, what are we doing all of this for? You know, what's that? <laughs> it seems like a heck of a way to have to do it if God's going to bring us the tomatoes. She said, oh, no, uh, the tomatoes are in the seeds. And I had this idea, like, there's tomatoes in the seeds. And as a little boy, I was thinking about that, and my brother was in first grade, or kindergarten, and he had one of those uh, plastic rulers with a magnifying glass on the end of it, you know, that just doubled. And I told him, go get your magnifying glass. And we took some of those tomato seeds, and we went out in the back in the chicken coop and cut open the seeds, literally. And I took his magnifying glass, and I'm looking in there for little miniature tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> now, 50 years and more have come and gone, and I know now that what, what Deepak was talking about, when you take that tomato seed and you put it under a microscope and turn up the magnification, first you'll find molecules and mostly spaces and atoms, and then you'll take the spaces out 
and you put an atom under the microscope and you'll see mostly spaces and now you see electrons and protons and crutons and neutrons and you know, whatever those things are that are in there, right? But it's mostly spaces. Then you take the electron and you put it under an electron microscope and you turn up the magnification, more spaces, mostly spaces, and you take out and you get subatomic particles and you keep going. All you're doing is looking for where the tomato comes from. Where's the source of tomato? You get to the tiniest, tiniest sub-subatomic sub, particle you put it in a particle accelerator, you increase it up to 250,000 miles an hour and collide them, you open up the accelerator and you realize there's nothing there. There's no thing there. And the weirdest part of all is that when you look at it, it changes it. That the observer really affects the creation process. Now you take the same seed that began you, you thought you started at some quantum picnic, right? Uh, nine months before your, uh, before your birth. So you take the seed that began you, and you do the same experiment, whether you just keep turning up the magnification and taking out the space, and guess what? Guess where you came from? No thing. No thing nuts. The source. See, in India, they talk about these people that we've been referring to. People like Jesus, people like Buddha, people like Muhammad. These great spiritual people, they call them non dual beings. Somehow they've transcended this duality of the physical plane. You know, the physical plane, you've never seen a person with a front who doesn't have a back, have you? you know, a person who's an outside who doesn't have an inside. Everything in the physical world has its opposite. To get past the physical world, you have to go to the world of no duality. And that is the equivalent of zero, mathematically. Zero is the number that you cannot cut in half. There's only one zero. And the equivalent of zero is called silence. And silence is the place where you go to. Melville said God's one and only voice is silence. When you go to silence, you literally go to the place within you that can no longer be divided. And that's where you make conscious contact. That's why meditation or getting quiet and discovering that place within you that can no longer be divided is, the, is really literally the source of all manifestation. And no matter where you go, I mean, I've talked to my friend here many times about it, and I'll call him up about something that's bothering me, this, and you know what he always says to me? Meditate. <laughs> <laughs> meditate on it, Wayne. I'll call Rita. I'll say, Rita, then she say, meditate. I said, Rita, I'm having a problem with one of my kids. What does she say? Tell him to meditate. <laughs> right, Rita? I mean, it's just... But the truth of it is, what they're saying is, shatter the illusion of your separateness, which is what meditation does. And make conscious contact. When you go there, then you discover the light that you were talking about, the being of light. And that's why meditation isn't just something that you do to have a peaceful existence. It's something that you do to make <laughs> conscious contact with the creation process and begin to manifest. There's a Vedic expression, in every seed is the promise of a thousand forests and more. Mm. In every seed is the promise of a thousand forests and more. Meditation is that ability to, to go beyond thought. The ability to think is an extraordinary human ability, but even more extraordinary is the ability to not think. <laughs> and I, I'd like to end uh, tonight's... Uh, session with a quote from Franz Kafka, who, when he spoke about meditation, he said, you need not do anything, just remain quiet. Remain sitting quietly at your table, and the world will freely offer itself to you to be unmasked. It has no choice. It will roll in ecstasy at your feet. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. This program is made possible by Hay House, an international publisher helping people transform their lives through books, audios, and gifts that inform, enlighten, and inspire. On the web at www.hayhouse.com.